Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I'm also from Black and Beach. I'm a colleague of Leon's, and I've been working on modeling the MABR for many years now. And we're working with uh, Fluence to model both of their systems, the S Spiral and the Subra. So I just wanted to introduce process models. Actually, can I ask how many people here work with process models on a regular basis? Okay, few in the back. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Fluence people, okay. <laughs> so what is a model? A model is just a simplified version of reality, a simplified representation of reality. And a, with a process model, we're trying to simplify um, what we observe at the wastewater treatment plant into mathematical, equ mathematical equations. So here we can see we have biological processes and here we have solid separation steps that we're modeling in um, through our mathematical equations. So in a wastewater treatment process model, you can really group the processes into three categories. Physical processes, which include settling and solids removal. Biological processes, which include biological growth and decay of different microorganisms and chemical processes, which include pH chemistry and precipitation. And so each of these subunits has some sort of combination of physical, biological, and chemical processes that we're modeling. The process models that we use can really be thought of as being made up of many different subunits or building blocks, kind of like uh, Legos or something like a toy like that. We can interchange different subunits to create the many different processes that we observe at wastewater treatment plants. For example, for this simple uh, treatment process, we can add on um, solids treatment, thickening and digestion, anaerobic digestion. And then we can even go on to add uh, dewatering and a novel process such as phosphorus recovery or the Struvite reactor with um, pH control. So with these process models, they're comprised of many different subunits and the MABR model is one subunit that we've been trying to model. So how can you use process models? Well, you can use them for many different reasons at many different uh, points in process development or in technology development. You can use them to support hypothesis development. You can use them to support your interpretation of results. Advance the mechanic, me mechanistic understanding. To ask what if questions of the plant. Um, ask how does my upstream or downstream stream process affect my overall treatment performance? And then, you know, you can use these models to aid in your design. So to summarize, I really feel that the model is the bridge between design and experiment. With experiments, we inform model development, and with models, we can help form hypotheses and ask what if questions and do preliminary research. From the model that's informed from the experiment, we can use that to size our reactors. And again, um, our designs and what we observe in the field can inform and improve our model predictability. So there are quite a few of whole plant simulators out there that are commercially available. Um, some of the most popular ones include BioWin, uh, Sumo, which is relatively new, GPSX, Simba, West, and Stoat. The MABR submodel is available in three different simulators right now, GPSX, Simba, and also in Sumo, you can develop your own model because it's a very flexible um, platform. As of now, there's only one simulator that can model the flat sheet spiral bound MABR, which is Fluence's um, modules. And this is in GPSX version 8. 
So I just wanted to take a step back and go over and be more specific and discuss MABR models. So of course there's the empirical model. You know, we can develop rules of thumb from what we observe at the treatment plant. For the uh, numerical model, we can use one-dimensional models, which are comprised of me many layers of CSTRs. So each layer of the biofilm is modeled by a uniform layer. We have two-dimensional models, which capture the heterogeneity of the biofilm in terms of its composition of uh, microorganisms and its structure. So in this example down here, uh, computational fluid dynamics was used to inform when bacteria would attach and detach from the biofilm. And then we can also model in three dimensions. For the process models that we're using, such as bio, um, well, yeah, BioWin biofilm model and GPSX biofilm model, all of the major software packages use a one-dimensional biofilm model. So I just wanted to go a little more in depth on what is comprised, what it's comprised of. We have multiple layers, a bulk liquid layer, which is well mixed, so you assume concentrations are uniform, a liquid diffusion layer, which creates a diffusional boundary between the bulk liquid and the biofilm, and then a biofilm that's comprised of many layers of CSTRs. So each layer has an equal concentration, and by doing that, we're able to capture the diffusional effects um, of the biofilm. Oops, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to advance the animations here. So particulate uh, state variables and soluble state variables can be transported from the bulk liquid into the biofilm across the liquid diffusion layer um, through diffusion. And then in the biofilm, the, they're mainly transported through diffusion, but you can also have some um, transportation of, or advection factor. And then the unique aspect of the MABR is that we have to transfer oxygen across the membrane wall. So in a way, this membrane wall also serves as a diffusional barrier. So within this one-dimensional biofilm subunit that's included in GPSX, we can categorize how we're modeling um, physically, how we use the physical model, the biofilm model, the aeration model, and the biokinetic model to make up this one subunit. The parameters that we need for each of these models, I, as, a, as the modeler or the user, need to input the dimensions of the MABR in the membrane surface area, which I think is obvious. The biofilm model, these parameters are a little harder to get at. We need the liquid diffusion layer thickness, the biofilm thickness, um, the dry weight, the rate of attachment and detachment, diffusivities within the biofilm, and solids exchange rate. For the aeration model, we need to know the mass transfer coefficient across that membrane material and the inlet oxygen concentration. And then for the biokinetic model, we want to know the kinetic and stoichiometric rates of each of the microbial processes that we're trying to capture. <laughs> So now I'm going to discuss the fluence modeling that we've been um, doing. And I'm going to explain this using three examples. So for the first example, we use sensitivity analysis to understand which parameters are the most important, which parameters affect the predicted biofilm ammonia removal rate, which we were most interested in. So I just told you all of the parameters that a user needs to input into the biofilm model. Many of these are easy to get at, like what are the, what's the membrane surface area, but a lot of them are more difficult to, to measure, like biofilm thickness and liquid diffusion layer thickness. So what we wanted to do is understand which of these parameters actually affects the biofilm ammonia removal rate. And so we performed a sensitivity analysis where we varied one parameter at a time and here, um, this was for the Aspiral model. We compared, for example, the ammonia removal rate when we varied the biofilm thickness, sorry, from 250 to 1,000 microns. And then we compared that against actual plant data. 
So we did this for a variety of the uh, parameters, and what we found is that many of them do impact the biofilm ammonia removal rate based on where they're located in the uh, S-spiral reactor. But two of them that may have the biggest impact are the oxygen transfer efficiency and the biofilm thickness. So I would say that this one-dimensional model is, could be co considered almost multi-scale modeling because not only are we able to get the gross rate, the gross ammonia removal rate for that module, but we're also able to understand what's going on inside of the biofilm. So here I'm showing substrate profiles, substrate profiles of oxygen, nitrogen, and biomass within the biofilm. So zero means we, this is the biofilm layer closest to the membrane wall, and 250 microns represents, this is the boundary between the biofilm and the bulk liquid. So we're able to understand why we may be getting better or worse rates. In this case, for the 250 micron biofilm, most of the oxygen is consumed in the inner regions of the biofilm closest to the membrane, and then the rest of the biofilm is left anoxic. So we are ammonia limited and oxygen limited in this biofilm. Example three, we need to calibrate and validate the spiral and super models to the data that's being collected. In order to do that, we developed both um, reactor models in GPSX and we adjusted those parameters that I discussed, the ones we found to be the most sensitive, we adjusted them until we got best fit among multiple scenarios that were run out at MyNSV. And we were able to try to um, optimize our model so that we're getting the best predictability. But there's always more we can do. There's always more we can do. So for our future work, we're trying to systematically evaluate biofilm activity under variable loads. We want to know the best and we want to know the extremes so that we can test the model over that range and make sure that it still is predict it still can predict and simulate what we observe in reality. We can calibrate the model to dynamic results. Before we used uh, average average daily uh, results but we know that things are changing diurnally. So we can use the model to ensure that we can um, capture what is going on um, under the variable loading that occurs throughout the day. And then finally, uh, we can use probabilistic methods like Monte Carlo analysis to find uh, the best fit for a spiral in Supra. So before I showed you that long list of parameters that we need to input, and a lot of them are important depending on the application, by using Monte Carlo analysis, we can find the optimized parameter set, not just changing one parameter at a time, but changing multiple parameters at the same time. So we can develop the best model, um, the, best, the most robust model that can be used for design of these systems. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Do you consider the temperature? Yes, we do. We also model the temperature. Oh, the question is, do we also consider the temperature? And yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thank you.